Valdosta is a town built on old traditions and institutions. The South Georgian city is home to many different cultures and one would hope that would work towards promoting positive race relations, but that is not the case here. The evidence lies in the people and is buried within the very foundations of the community. On the south side, there are barely any streetlights. The sidewalks are run down and the houses are in shambles to name a few of the communal issues. The population there is predominantly African-American as well, begging the question of why the city is consistently ignoring these particular areas. The South, especially towns like Valdosta, still suffer from oppressive rule and inequality, both of which are key in keeping areas like Southside from improving. We tried to reach out to the Valdosta School Board to get a different viewpoint, but they did not contact us back. Here's more on the issue from another member of the Southside. My name is Vince Jupiter. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary studies major here at BSU, and um, my focuses are African American studies and mass media. Vince Jupiter, a senior interdisciplinary studies major, has lived in Valdosta for the last five years. Over the course of his stay here, the future director has mingled with individuals from all walks of life. Working at In The Game Sports, a local magazine, has put him on the sidelines of many sporting events in South Georgia. He spends his free time directing music videos for local musicians and creating promotional ads for local businesses. Some people just aren't familiar with uh, different types of races. And, um, you know, coming to college, especially at an age like 18, you may not know how to interact with a certain type of person or a certain type of person from a different background. So because of that, people are very unfamiliar with a, a different type of person and just may not know how to, you know, approach someone or, you know, be a friend to someone. Um, when it comes to inequality, I just feel, um, I feel strongly about it because I sometimes feel certain types of people don't always get, um, you know, the same amount of opportunities that other people get, whether it be, you know, white, black, Mexican, anything. I mean, it's just, so in certain situations, not everyone gets treated the same, and um, that can go in almost any field, any area of study, any uh, profession. Vince Jupiter's point of view reminds us of the heart of the matter. We reached out to certain members of the city council and the NAACP, but they either would not speak to us or simply did not respond after repeated requests for an interview. Reverend John Robinson, longtime pastor and local activist, shared with us his story of institutionalized racism. I'm an activist in the community and I live in Lake Park and I'm a minister at the First Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. And what I basically do is try to promote entrepreneurship and promote businesses in, in our local area so they can help the local economy. You know, the city was, was built from a plantation type city, okay? Uh, to get a good grasp of where we are today, we have to look back over history. Over the years, there was the development of a mentality about being a uh, stem from like a plantation type town. There was no inclusion as far as blacks and real to say outsiders, okay? They had a, uh, in, as late as 2004, there was a, uh, charter that was put up that had to be taken down because it related to blacks in a very negative manner. And that was in 2004. Uh, when it comes down to justice and equality, there's a power structure here that needs to be breaking, broken long years ago. Down through the years, things didn't change. The way they have been for all these years, practicing exclusion. There's a lot of federal funds that come through the city and the county. And they just don't seem to be spread abroad for everyone in the neighborhoods and no, throughout the, the no, no, sure they're not, they're not. Uh, we had a bridge built here for $70 million. We didn't get any part of that, okay? Had a project at PCA, the paper mill, for $460 million. It was federal aided. We didn't get any parts of that. It's a courthouse built just down the street here for millions of dollars. We didn't, we didn't get any parts of that. Mm -hmm. um, then they built this new school for $85 million. We got less than 1% of 1% of that. So Minority contractors, yes, yes, and local businesses. Uh, the majority of the money left the city, okay? Now they had some that stayed here, but it's normally the people that's always in power, yeah. okay? Same people 
gets the money over and over and over, time after time. Uh, our theory is that if you get the money spread abroad and money can be kept in the local areas, therefore it boosts the local economy. And if the local economy is, is lift, this means that if you change the environment, you change the people. Well, what we've done, we've been participating at city council meetings, uh, chamber of commerce. Uh, we've been active in putting on uh, presentations to show the difference, uh, to help make a difference, and we're still in the process of working now, okay? Um, we want to try to bring people together so that they can begin to realize that it's enough for everybody. Another unfortunate statistic shows that Valdosta has experienced a 28% increase in population growth in the past 10 years, with most of the new residents being African American. Yet, these are some of the very people who are still struggling to be treated equally. Terry Kelly, one of the contractors who could not get bids despite the city's population growth and election of new officials, talked with us as well. He detailed what it has been like trying to get work in Valdosta as a minority. Right. Um, the work here in Valdosta, I've been here, as I said, all my life. I yet have did everything, the VSAP programs they have. Matter of fact, right down the street, I helped uh, fund the very first gentleman was named Hunter. Uh, Hunter. Hunter started the first VSAP program. And when he started it, I was funding it for the start, yet still haven't got anything. I've been here all of my life, and I yet have a job from Valdosta. Wow. And what? And I've did everything. I'm licensed here. I'm licensed in the state as a GCI. But yet I go all over the state, all the way up to Carolinas, down to my city, Florida. But I get work there. And I decided two years ago when this project came up about the high school, that I would, bring, I would bring some of the guys that I was working with here and see if we could put together a team to do work out there. So I went through, I met with the architects. Matter of fact, uh, Ken Altman's father, his grandfather, my father, did most of the surveying in this town. And, and then once they did that, Altman and I got together with 35 uh, minority contractors to see if we can put together a nucleus that will work for us to do the new high school. We did everything that was qualified and asked of us to do. And once we did that, we bid it, and I was the only minority contractor in this area to bid it. And from that point, they said I was the low bidder of the day of the bid. And I was the low bidder. They called me after the bid over. Because? I was the low bidder. And I was out there to do the uh, clearing and grubbing. And when we started the project, they said that if we were, were going to bid it in three phases. Once we got into uh, the bid, I called them and set up time to meet with them and ask them to say, well, on the, on the drawings, they're showing infrastructure for one whole bid. They said, we're going to break it up in three. I broke the bid up into three bid, I mean, into three parts. And when I bidded it, the clearing and grubbing, they said I was low bidder but I was extremely low. So from September the 1st to September the 13th, they allowed me to be low bidder. Then when we had a board meeting, they assumed that I couldn't do the work and they took it. I don't know a handful of subs in Valdosta that is on the programs here that actually get any work here. So the work has really been an old boy system, you know, and what it is they, they bring in now, they used to would give us some sub work, but now they're doing it themselves. They're bringing in and they bring in workers and put together a team and do they're it themselves. They're not giving locals a chance to, to do that work. They're not giving locals any chance. Matter of fact, this project was $85 million and we got less than 1% of 1% of minority contract work. We don't have a one cent. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Plumbers, carpenters, brick masons, tile setters, painters, contractors, we have at least four a re a residential contractors here that are minorities, and we probably have two commercial contractors. And none of us receive any work at no time.
Roosevelt Standifer, teacher at Highland Christian Academy and founder of Works for Good, talked with us on how to resolve the race problem in Valdosta. My role within the community is community engagement. And I say that working with organizations to help them make a difference and to ultimately give back to the community in a way that makes sure that the next generation is not only prepared, but also um, available to be a part of the process. Um, Works for Good is specifically set up for that. Uh, we would like to continue to mentor um, the next generation, but also provide access to opportunities, those opportunities that would allow them to grow in leadership, as well as giving them the opportunity to, one, um, interact with a diverse population, which South Georgia is very, what I would call, diverse. I think that until people actually get to know you, and know where you're at. I think they would potentially discredit you um, from a, whether it be a stereotype of, um, of your ethnicity or whether it be they are not used to interacting on a level of business, personally or socially to an individual. Um, I think it takes, um, getting used to. Um, it takes getting to know someone and until that becomes a narrative where people are more interested in getting to know new people regardless of their backgrounds or what they look like, what religion they might be, I think it's um, one thing that we will continue to see happen and it's not with I think malice or ill intentions but I think it's just comfortability. Um, you're comfortable um, talking to people who talk like you, who look like you, who are interested in the things that you're interested in. I remember a story of a family member of mine that says to me, you hunt? I can't believe you hunt. Well, let me just tell you this. Civilization was built upon the, the premise of in order for you to eat, you had to kill something to eat. Um, you had to grow something to feed your family. We're so disconnected from the reality of how we came along as a society. And I think we just need to get back to the basics. Right. And um, those things I think are fundamental things that if you don't look like me, if you don't talk like me, or if you don't interact within the circles that I am constantly getting access to go into, then you might discredit someone that might have potentially something that can add value to your life. Being united as a city, it it's a, unity in yeah, it's it's a twofold question. Mm -hmm. um, you have to say, but united for what? United for what? And I think that goes to a bigger issue. Um, what are we pushing for? A city can come together. When you have the death of someone, like the tragedy that happened with the active shooter in Florida and all over the country throughout these last 10 years, we've seen an increase in school shootings. Well, we see communities unite together for a moment. So, yes, cities can come together for a moment, but what is the takeaway? What are we doing to really make social change? What are we doing to really make the change that could create uh, a better environment for the next generation to grow up in? Well, so with Works for Good, we are actually taking the next generation and allowing them to participate in those very key and fundamental sectors of our community. In South Georgia, farming and agriculture is a huge industry, okay? Well, what we've done is we've said, we will allow any youth that would like to learn this industry, we will give them land for them to work. We will give them livestock to raise. And then we will allow them to come to our market store 
which you happen to see now, where they can actually go in and actually distribute and sell and make money for themselves. So they're growing, mm -hmm. they're learning, mm -hmm. and they're earning. Job growth. Job, job growth. yeah. Right. Job creation. And they get amazing, amazing life skills. Life skills. Interacting with people that are from all walks of life. All walks of life. With Georgia being the third most racist state in America, it is not surprising that people have these stories of inequality. We have heard people's experiences, and Vadasta clearly has a lot of growing to do, but there are some who are ready to act. I have something here that, that'll show where they'll show that race here is the most common ethnicity is 80,000 versus blacks is 48,000. Okay. Is that, that's for about Austin? Yes, that's, that, that's, that's, one, that's one way of putting it right. Then on the other hand, it contradicts itself. It shows where blacks is 50.3%. Mm -hmm. Okay, but now when this goes out, now this is in 2016, when this goes out, it shows where the city is majority white, which is not. We are in search of truth and fairness. We believe that if you get funding available throughout the black community and the old traditional black community, it'll change the structure of the neighborhood. You know, they come down, they, they, they gave us the uh, Martin Luther King Monument, okay? That was like a Cadillac sitting in the middle of a landfill, okay? Because, you know, they come down, the, the, the city, they boasted about what they've done, but the minority contractors and local businesses didn't get any of the work there, you know? And that was over a million dollars. Yes, so it hurts to witness funding coming through a city, everybody's thriving. As you can look around here in this city, I can point out every business here, but none of them is black owned. But we went from getting our rights to vote, our freedom, and we became a labor force, not sharing an ownership. That's financing all the upper businesses that's not owned by minorities, okay? And, and that's, a sad, that's a sad part. In other words, you can go out of the community and make the money, turn around and take it back to Winn-Dixie, take it back to Publix, take it back to J.C. Penney's, Walmart, but nothing is coming back into, the, into our own neighborhoods and communities. Yeah. I knew that it, in order for my children to grow up here and not go to Atlanta, not go to Miami, and t catch out to all the cities, and then still have to come back here, uh, I want to see, well, if there's, a, if there's a goal in mind to make this city uh, no limits, then at least they need to start putting in the planning part situation where they can start putting us in where we can talk about it. Can we reach all the goals? If they're there, I'm quite sure, even with the goals that they give us, most of the time, Scarlett, we won't reach them. But if they're there, then your age limit would have something to start drawing lines to reach. You see what I'm saying? We can build this, we can build Valdosta, not for 2018, uh, we can build Valdosta for 2050. And for anyone, and and for, any color. For any, uh, any color, women, men, it don't matter. Reverend Robinson hit the nail on the head as he wrapped up the final step on Valdosta's road to a less racially biased and more unified community. People have to come together and got to realize the truth and face the facts. No one want to sit down and discuss the real hardcore issues about black and white. No, no, nobody seemed to want, want to discuss that. You know, uh, everyone want to avoid the issue of, of what really have occurred in this country, yeah. where we are going in this nation, and what we need to do to resolve the problems that we have. We, we need more unity, more harmony. We, we need a whole lot of diversity to occur here in this city that haven't been happening, and, and, and it's all been leaning mostly to one side. I believe, I believe that it's healed in time. It's healed in time. Okay? We, as black people, feel excluded, okay? And normally, we are excluded. We got a right to vote, we, we got a chance to do a lot of different things, but now we're in the time where it's a healing time, where, we, where it's time for healing, the old wounds, and that opens the doors for justice and equality. My team and I have worked tirelessly to uncover the truths about the relations between races here in Valdosta.
What we have found is that the people have been affected by unchecked prejudices within the city's infrastructure. With less than 1% of 1% of the contractors getting work, Valdosta is worse off than we thought. However, the situation is not without hope. It is a group effort, and only by coming together to spread our message of equality can we start to break down the long-standing walls of racism. Justice for all. Justice for all. Yeah, I find happiness within the struggle. With all this weight, my ankles never buckle. Authentication, they can never muzzle. It's something great when your whole city loves you. And when you know you're blessed, it's easy to look up and thank the Lord above you. Now all you people looking puzzled, mad at the switch up. And y'all be sleeping when it's clear it's time to get up. Uh, but the change is out of reach, cause all these teachers never teach. And all these pastors scared to preach. Look, I'm down to talk about it. They steer the boat while everybody's drowning. My vision's clear, they got your vision clouded. I love this life, so I'ma sing about it. While other men can only dream about it. I ain't lying. It ain't my fault you took a different path. Look, it ain't my fault you never did the math. Yeah, that picture's grainy, should've hit the